Instagram, TikTok, including threads at Y244 channel. On Instagram is Y244 underscore channel. By the way, we are verified with a blue check mark. And you can find me as well at Brian Sokol 101. Now, in this segment, live in studio with us, we have a very powerful guest in studio who is going to actually take us through his journey, the trials and the triumphs of working through, you know, so many careers, but all the way from San Jose in California, from the United States of the America. We're being joined live right here in studio by the the one and the only Aaron Phillips. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Nice to meet you in person. Hey, this is awesome. Thank All you right. so much for the invite, man. Karibu sana. Are there some Swahili ones that you've already learned? You know what? I have, <laughs> I, I, I'm terrible at learning like new languages and whatnot, but everybody's telling me, you got to learn Swahili. I'm going to learn. I'm going to. Uh, akuma, akuma, uh, akuma Matata? Akuma Matata. Akuma Matata. Yes. Oh, I, I love the way you said Akuma Matata. <laughs> 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 it's like one of the common uh, Swahili words. That's yeah, yeah, out there, yeah, even yeah. Lion King. Well. In the United States, there's a movie called Lion King. They always talk about that. Right. So. <laughs> yeah, that's where they have the phrase, Hakuna Matada. That's how you guys <laughs> pronounce Matata, it. I know, right? <laughs> right. Uh, but so far, so good, Karibu to Kenya. Karibu means welcome. Karibu, thank you. Thank All right, you. so Karibu Sai. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, so uh, let's get to know you a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yes, we, we have introduced you come from the United States. Absolutely. Of the Americas. Yes. Uh, the great. <laughs> Where well, our Obama is there. Obama, so, yes. Just a little story about you. How yeah. did you start up? Yeah. Where did you grow up in America? Absolutely. And how did you end up in the tech world as crazy, well? Crazy, right? It's crazy, right? So, uh, um, so I grew up in uh, the Bay Area, which is like San Francisco Bay Area. Okay. And uh, it was, I, I'm a child of the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, grew up kind of, kind of poor, you know, okay. we, we, didn't, we didn't really have a whole lot, you know, I, I, a lot of people look at me right now and they think, oh man, he can't relate to like what people's struggles are. Trust me, we struggled big time, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it was okay. We had a lot of love in our family. Um, you know, the, the area that I lived in, it was diverse, it was a little diverse, so it helped me in my career to be able to understand people. Right. Um, I graduated from high school and I'm dyslexic. That's one of the things I always point out in all the interviews is I'm dyslexic. And I had a right. lot of issues learn, you know, growing up, uh, learning issues. Uh, you know, it, it, it prevented me from finishing college, which was you know, disappointing in a way because I'm one of those guys that's always had high you know, drive. I knew I was gonna be successful, but it was okay. I, couldn't, I didn't understand what it was because being dyslexic is a little, it's a little, little challenging. There's different levels of being dyslexic, but you know what? I always had a drive that I was going to be successful. To matter, no matter what it, what I was going to do, I was right. going to be successful. So I got into the environmental industry. So okay. I ended up cleaning up chemical spills. If you guys can believe that, I went to yeah. Alaska, cleaning up chemical spills out in the you know frozen tundra, yeah. uh, which was amazing as a young guy. But you guy, studied for that course as well, a actually, course in chemistry. Actually, what happened is that while I was working that job. I learned that the guys that made the most money were the chemists. Right. And see, I didn't finish college, so I had to teach myself chemistry just to, under, just to be able to get that promotion. And I did. It took me about a year and a half to yeah. figure it out, but I got it. And from that yeah. point on, I didn't look back. I started working for the Department of Energy. I worked at, uh, at Stanford University uh, you know, very, at a very young age, about 24 years old. I always had a high drive, guys, so you have to understand. Yeah. I, always, I never wanted to settle for just, eh, you know, you know, working there was a good job. I was married at the time, and my ex-wife thought I was crazy because that I wanted to leave that job, but I knew yeah. I was gonna stay there only a couple of years because I just wanted the experience. I didn't, yeah. I didn't care about the money or anything like that. And then was after, it a toxic job or something? Uh, it was, uh, I used to, so that particular position was I used to clean up the spills at the site, but I used to write up reports for the government. So it was Department of Energy, so I worked for the Department of Energy. So there was a little bit, but okay. my background and training in, in the industry we always were very safe because right. in that industry, you had, you know, you had to make sure you take care of yourself. Right. Um, but that, now let's fast forward. I ended yeah. up working, say, 17 years for a company, a uh, startup company, an environmental company. And from that yeah. point on, I, I never looked back. I mean, I knew that, I knew that, that, that environmental was going to be my, my industry. It was going to take me you know, where I wanted to go. Okay. Uh, we got bought yeah. out by a large company. I ended up leaving like 2000, start my own uh, consulting firm in about 2000. Three two thousand. No, actually, it, it was more like two thousand eight. Right. And from there, I started working for an, a uh, a recycling company, a metal okay. recycling company. I became the CEO of the company. Worked okay. there for a few years with uh, it, with my uh, consulting company, and then from that point, I moved over to Tesla. Now, right. Tesla. Is Boom. <laughs> my claim to fame in life. Let me tell you guys. And you got a chance to work with Elon Musk. I used to have to meet with uh, Elon Musk every two weeks. So, okay. so literally every two weeks, he would, we'd have a skip level meeting, which means that 
My, my manager at the time was a guy named Greg Rykel. He was like the CEO of Tesla, didn't have it, but he was like second in command. Nice. Uh, and I worked for him. So Elon wanted to meet with everybody's, you know, all his direct reports. So he right. had probably 15 direct reports. So every two weeks we'd have to sit down. And let me right. tell you something about Elon Musk, okay? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you worked there as a global senior manager. Global for senior manager. a part called environmental sustainability. I, I was in charge of global sustainability for the Fremont factory for China, for the Netherlands. We had okay. a remand fa facility there. So I, was, I had my team, I had 400 people underneath me. Uh, right. about, fi about 14 managers, you know, globally. So, right. yeah. But one thing about working with Elon, uh -huh. uh, uh, Elon doesn't, he doesn't care about PowerPoints. He doesn't care about uh, what you say you can do. He just cares about getting things done. All right. Okay. And, and, and again, I'm going to curse a little bit. He always say, get shit done. And that's what okay. our team did. We got shit done. We uh -huh. made sure that Tesla was, when I started with Tesla, they were kind of a brown company. They weren't green. They okay. were a brown company, but my team ended up just turning the, the, the corporation around. We won awards there. Uh, even Elon acknowledged our, our group was very difficult. For Elon to acknowledge you, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really, really big deal. He never got the name of our group right, but he did acknowledge us, and everybody at the, at the factory knew <laughs> he was talking about us. <laughs> right. you know? But uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was, he was quite, the, uh, quite the, the person that, that I could say, I'm not gonna say I looked up to him, okay. because again, He's, he's, he's a very difficult person to work for, but I did Very admire, difficult? Very difficult. Okay. He would fire you. Well, I mean, one of our first meetings I had with him, I didn't know him at the time. He came in and just, just went off on okay. like everybody in the room. And I didn't realize why I was even in the room, to be honest with you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting story. I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll, leave that for another, I'll leave it for another time, but yeah. All right, we, uh, I'm just going to also look at uh, what you were doing at Tesla. Mm -hmm. Yeah, member of, of the executive factory management team for air emissions. Correct. Uh, meaning that the, there was like a production site yeah, where they, yeah. they had this going on. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things about me is that I'm very good at a lot of things, but I usually bring in, you know, subject matter experts. So okay. we, one of our responsibilities was air emissions, was hazardous waste, was trash, was recycling, was, you know, we were in charge of anything that was, that was a byproduct of the factory, we okay. were in charge of managing it, you know, keeping the KPIs, making sure that we had the regulatory agencies off our back, because trust Carbon me, regulation. in California, there's tons of regulations. What's that? Carbon regulation? Is Carbon it? regulations, yes, absolutely. Carbon footprint, basically anything, it was, it came through our group. Right, and, and somebody who's watching this conversation, they would wonder how at Tesla, are they having carbon emission? Where is this carbon coming from? Well, and yet well okay, it's all about okay, so think about it. There's vehicles, like right. paint right. For, the, for when you paint the cars. There's, right. there's organic material that, you know, that gets uh, uh, emitted into the uh, atmosphere. So you have to be able to capture that when you're in the painting process. Yeah. There's, there's ways of like thermal units that, ex that, that capture that organic material so it doesn't become carbon or go carbon to the air. Right. And we release a, a small amount. You know, we're really good. In California, where I'm at, California is highly regulated. So okay. we have air emissions that, say, Texas doesn't have. Okay. That you really have to have to be. Everything has to be permitted. It's it's just it's one of the most difficult states, but it's right. one of the best states too. But it's one of the right. most difficult states for a business to run a business like a big, huge manufacturing facility right. because of the regulations. Interesting. In your scope of, of, of experience, uh, comparing like uh, where you worked at and mm -hmm. maybe now Kenya from what you've read and what you've known, mm -hmm. maybe is there like a comparison to where maybe Kenya is rising up when it comes to also doing yeah. something like carbon, carbon control and emissions? So, so I don't know a lot. So I'm learning. That's one of the reasons why I'm here about okay. what the policies are or whatnot. I know I'm going to be meeting with some government people to talk about that, to talk about like renewable energy and, and, and whatnot. Um, so I can't really give you a clear answer on that yet, but I will. That's one of the reasons why I'm here. Okay. All right. Uh, before we talk about uh, dyslexia, yeah. uh, you, you, you've also worked for other several companies. Yeah. And uh, let me just pinpoint it a little bit so that you talk about it. Sure. You are a Chief Operations Officer at uh, the American uh, Metal, Metal and Iron, Iron yep. Inc. Mm -hmm. So what was happening in this company? Because there's a lot of also scrap, <laughs> <laughs> scraps. Yeah. In yeah, Kenya, yeah, we have yeah. like scrap uh, yeah. metal companies that Absolutely. collect scrap metals. Absolutely. And then it has again to go to like waste management. So uh, please talk about it as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So, so when I started my consulting business, there was this guy. He, he knew my, 
he knew my reputation, and in the environmental industry, you know, everybody knows who you are. So if you talk to people in California, they knew who I am. Right. I've been doing it for a long time, and we're highly regulated, so there isn't there's there isn't any kind of shenanigans. You got it. Like if you pick up some waste, you have to manage it properly. It's documented. There's you know you can't you can't you know say hey I'm going to go throw this I'm going to take this acid and I'm going to treat it and you know neutralize it and dispose of it and then go bury it somewhere. We have right. regulations. In right. the metal industry, the metal recycling industry, it's a little bit different because there isn't these regulations because it's not technically hazardous. So okay. the guy who owned the company um, is, is, his name is, his name is Howard. He hired me to come in to basically bring the value of his company up and I had no idea. He offered me a ton of money to leave my, to leave my business to go work for him. He, okay. he, he, just, he, sent me, he just offered me this crazy money. But what I realized is two years later, he sold the business and it, <laughs> we, I brought his value up at his company because I'm very good at metrics and very good at organization. You know, it's, you know, system management. You know, I'm real good at the, real good at that. So that's what I did. I turned his company around. So, right. our, so, metal, so that was actually really good for me because it gave yeah. me some experience in the understanding sustainability to a certain extent, in recycling, recycling metal to a certain extent. So it was good experience. It was, it was really a dream job. I came in, yeah. organized this company. I think the company was worth about 40 million before I started, and then he ended up selling the company for $65 million okay. when, we were all, when it was all said and done. So that okay. really, it, it's, it, it just, it's a testament to my career. So every career that I've ever worked at, I yeah. learned a little bit and I brought it to the next company. I brought it to the next level. You know, I, right. I, I basically leveled up on everything. So that, that uh, um, American Metal and Iron, it, it catapulted me into Tesla because Tesla yeah. had everything that was in the American Metal and Iron. Everything we did there, they did there, but they just didn't have the process to set up. They didn't have the, the, they didn't have the organization. They didn't have the people. They didn't have the trucks. They didn't have all the things that we ended up putting in. Uh, in place, you know, later on. So that was amazing. I loved that job. I yeah. loved it. Right now, when you compare uh, the growth of industries for the, the American, the American uh, experience and uh, what we have here in Africa, mm -hmm. do you feel like uh, Africa is still on that trajectory of maybe trying to re to discover what they're good at and what they're not good at? And then when it comes to also mitigating things like air pollution, the stories like climate change. Uh, recently, they're going to to have actually um, a, a meeting where they're going to have officials from each and every country to talk about that. When you compare the conversations that are being had in your country and maybe Africa, do you feel like we are there? And when it comes yeah. to also mitigating Africa, are we mitigating or, or, or what is the problem with Africa now that you have this experience looking at it from an American perspective? Yeah, so um, you know, we've been doing it long. I mean, I mean, the bottom line, I mean, when it comes to say regulations because new energy, it's like we've been doing it longer. So, you know, we're, we're not quite there. So we're still, I mean, even though it's as advanced as we are, you know, we still have a long way to go. Okay. Uh, what I'm finding out in Africa, there's a lot of great ideas, some great minds here. That's why I'm so excited to be in Kenya. You guys, right. have, this is my first first time in Africa, so right. you know, it's co you know coming to Kenya, um, and just certain individuals that I've talked to, just some basic conversation. I don't know exactly. I'm again, I, you know, I, and I don't want to, you know, you know, Guess skirt the or question or whatever. Anything. But really, yeah. it, okay. I've. If I don't know, I'm going to tell you I don't know. Right. But I'm going to learn. So you're I'm going to, to find out. I'm, I'm at, this is what this trip is for. It's for me to learn, to meet, to find okay. out like what is it that I can bring as far as my experience? Because I have yeah. experience in everything, in air, in water. 36 years. Has place. Yeah, you know, I mean, almost 40 years have been do, I've been doing this. Right. So I have experience in just about a little bit of everything. I know people who know people who know people. So yeah. it's, you know, it's like what can I do to help Kenya? You know, get to that next level when it comes to environmental, when it comes to climate change, when it comes to uh, you know renewable energy, when it comes to sustainability. What can I do to help Kenya get there? All right, and it's interesting because uh, last week on Monday we were actually marking a National Youth Day, which uh, the theme for this year was Green Skills yeah. for Sustainable Economy. I love that. All right, uh, and I'll, let's still also get back to your country. Maybe when it comes to also things like carbon control. Mm -hmm. Uh, other things like air pollution and many other aspects of that. Like in your country, what are some of the tools that you guys use to control maybe like things like air pollution, soil pollution, water, water pollution, which is actually part of the environment sure. as well sure. for companies, sure. especially tech Absolutely. companies. Yeah. Absolutely. Please talk about that. So in the United States, we have a group called the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. So the EPA regulates water discharge, the air regulations. They, they regulate, you know, basically uh, toxic, toxicity. Um, you know, with chemicals, there's certain uh, ratings that they give. You know, processes. Yeah. So if you're a, if you're a business, um, and again, I'm going to talk about California, guys, because okay. 
I want your, your viewers to understand, in the United States, it's not the same everywhere. So every, so every state is a little bit different. My state is highly regulated. We, okay. we, we have regulations in the state of California that are beyond the federal regulations. So be, beyond what Washington says, you know, what, what Biden and all those guys say or the EPA say, we have our own EPA in the state of California. So if you're a business like a Tesla, you're going to have to follow the regulations that the, that the feds say that you have to follow, and then you have to follow the regulations of the state. So one thing about this, the feds is the feds say, okay, what, who are the polluters? What, what, what is causing all this pollution? Well, yeah. typically it's industrial or it's individuals, cars, you know, um, yeah. you know I'll just say cars. So they're yeah. going to regulate the emissions in the cars. Like, like, for instance, in California, you have to have a smog check on your car. It has to pass yeah. a smog check. Your, right. If it doesn't pass, you can't get your registration and you'll get fined and a whole bunch of other things. So if you have an older car that won't pass the smog check, Okay. Um, they're going to force you to, you know, get a, an abatement device, you know, for your car. Yeah. It sounds harsh, but really, it's the reason why California drives the in, drives the nation when it comes yeah. to the environmental regulations. You right. know, um, so there's many things. There's caps that they put on how much carbon that you can release, you know, with your company. Um, you know, there's just there's a ton of things that they do to to regulate. And again, right. it just all depends on what we're talking about. We're talking about water discharges. Right. There's, there's local agencies that regulate the, wh how much solids that can be released into the, into the water system, how yeah. much uh, chemicals, the type of chemicals that can be released, you know, there's right. certain levels. When we were at Tesla, we had, we had five huge, like 500,000 gallon uh, 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 tanks, the treatment tanks that we'd have to treat every single day, our water, our water treatment. We'd have to test it on site to make sure that it didn't have the metals in there or the solids before we could discharge it. And if it did, we have to retreat it and retreat it before we could discharge it. Right. So those are some of the things that that I know that Kenya does. I'm gonna take a look at a lot of, a lot of that, but I know that that's a lot of similar things. I'm sure yeah. that there's a lot of discharge that they have on those regulations, but I'm, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna find out, I'm gonna find yeah. out. Definitely should be the same path. I yeah. would think so, definitely, right. it's the way to go. Right. Uh, for, for someone who is watching, because uh, Tesla is a, is a big production of electric Huge. vehicles Huge. as well. Huge. But then somebody would say electric vehicle, how, how is it emitting carbon? <laughs> how is it polluting the air? Because uh, definitely there's no, like, there's no combustion. So, for, so there, for such an engine. Yeah, that's a good yeah. question. So there's a big debate about, okay, how green are electric cars? Because yeah. right now, when you think about this, how do you charge the battery? Well, typically it's a carbon, it's a, a coal generator somewhere that yeah. produces energy that yeah. recharges your battery. So how do you take an electric car that's supposed to be green, but you're using a, a dirty process, a dirty process to generate the energy? How yeah. do you, how do you, you know, make that make sense? Okay. Well, here's how you make it make sense. So we got to start somewhere. That's how, that's, that's the thing. And one of the things that Elon always talked about, you know, you got, it's like that first step. The first step is let's produce the cars that are cleaner. When you say cleaner, they're not producing um, any, any uh, carbon dioxide from the emissions. That's where, you know, most of, if you look at greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide is the most, it's, it's the most that's in the atmosphere. Right. So we're eliminating the carbon dioxide. Now, now, um, what we have is in the process. So to make the car, you're in, you're, you're, you have to, there, it's a dirty process to make the car. When you paint it, just like we talked about earlier, right. there's emissions mm -hmm. from the paint. Yeah. When you, and paint is chemicals as well. Paint, paint is chemicals. Yeah. When you make the parts, we're taking casting, metal castings, we're, we're, we're firing uh, aluminum, metal casting, and there's emissions that come from the actual smoke and from the, the fire from the ca casting. Right. So again, that's, a, that's emitting, you know, carbon into the air. So you, to answer your question is that there's a dirty process in making it, but there's also a dirty process in charging it. But yeah. what's going to happen in California, this is why I say California is a lot different than, than the United States, the rest of the United States. California is going to ban um, gas-powered cars, by, by selling of gas-powered cars right. by 2030. So, right. so what they want is they want renewable energy. We want wind. We want uh, 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 wind, uh, water solar, well. solar power, <laughs> right. water. We yeah. want to take, get off the grid, get the dirty, the dirty processes off the grid, and yeah. use renewable energy. So now, if you have renewable energy that are that are powering these these cars, these cars yeah. that are now not emitting carbon dioxide into the into the air, yeah. y y the air is cleaner. It's a it's a better process. 
but it all starts somewhere. <coughs> and this is the beginning phases of it. This is, this is like, the, like, like Tesla came along and revolutionized you know, wh how, we, you know, how we think about our transportation. So we're in the beginning stages. So we're not gonna really see the byproducts of, of all this amazing stuff that we're doing far as with the lithium batteries and everything else okay. until later on, until things get cleaner. But this is the first start. This is, this is the beginning part of it. Yeah. Uh, and, and on that note, uh, I think also Kenya, uh, from our current president, mm -hmm. who just came into office mm -hmm. recently, mm -hmm. uh, in one of his money, in, in his manifesto, actually, e-mobility is uh, one of his big agenda. I love in, it. In a project called the Digital Super Highway, oh, okay. which is uh, embracing uh, EV yeah. vehicles, I love it, um, motorcycles, and so many other aspects. And definitely you'll get to see that part as you stay in I Kenya. I love it. I love it. Do you feel like maybe it's the future? E-mobility is the future. Absolutely. And I think uh -huh. I think in. Um, countries were, you know, like in, say, in say in Africa, you know, say the continent of Africa, like you sh like, like, I, I want to get ready to say we, you know, I feel like I'm Kenyan. <laughs> You're okay, already I just, Kenyan. I just, I just want, I, 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 I got to say this, I got to say this. I feel say like we. I'm, I, I, I we feel like that I'm, I'm Kenyan, even though, even though yeah. my father, my heritage is, is, uh, is West, is West Africa. My, right. my father was Nigerian actually. Okay. So, so, um, but, but I've been adopted by the Kenyans. So I'm, okay. so I'm Kenyan. Kenyan, my heart is, my heart is Kenyan. Yeah, my heart <laughs> is Kenyan. Uh, so I gotta say, I gotta say we. But okay. I feel like that, that in Africa, Africa, there's so many resources here. Like the world, the world turns to Africa for everything that they need. When it yeah. comes to lithium, I remember Elon Musk came out here and I was kind of laughing. I was thinking to myself, Africa should just like, you know what? We ain't selling no more lithium until you guys build factories here and do, you know, do, you know, like instead of shipping the lithium and, you know, to, to outside, outside of Africa, it should be right here. Like, or, or like the cobalt, all the metals, all the precious metals that you need to make the batteries. It's not just lithium, it's a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Um, but I really think that Africa could like drive the, the world. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, and it, sh and it should. And I like what you were saying, the, the initiative that, that the president, the new president has, that's, that's amazing. That's where it starts. It's yeah. about education too. It's about getting people, because a lot of people don't understand, even in the United States, there's a big, huge pushback when it comes to renewable energy. It's, it's politicized. There's a whole bunch of, and it's just, to me, it's just ridiculous. It's yeah. absolutely ridiculous. It's what's best for the environment. I always tell people that, I used to tell my team at Tesla, I used to say, listen, if you guys are stuck, Think about what, what the right thing to think, the right thing to do is. We yeah. can't, we, our team was put together, not because, you know, it was a, it's, it's this right thing to, you know, to say or do, sustainability, everyone's sustainability. No, 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 we were put together to clean up Tesla, to make Tesla a greener, comp, a greener place, and save the environment. And I really believe that. I really believe that. I think that every car that gets produced and, and it, gets, it replaces a gas-powered car that would have used fossil fuels, is saving the environment. And that's what our job was. Uh, right, uh, I, I want us to shift gears a little bit, but as we sum up on that part, maybe if you can uh, maybe highlight for us some of the most poisonous um, uh, uh, substances that are released by some of these uh, uh, tech companies, before we talk about DPX and green art solutions. You, you know what, I mean, there's a, there's a ton of things. Cause, so, so the EPA has a bunch of different chemicals. So you have hazardous waste and then you have extremely hazardous ways. Right. Now, a lot of I, tech companies really don't, so it's in the process, like say when you make chips and, and whatnot, they use acids, they use base, they use, um, you know, some metals or some heavy metals that are in there. Um, what's probably the, uh, the, the tech industry really, to be honest, it's more the, you know, the, the industry that, that I think that's probably the, the biggest polluter, I can say, it's more of the petro industry. There's a lot of organic material that gets released, the methane, okay. you know, the, the propane, the different gases that are getting released. So tech, they, you know, there's e-waste that you guys know that you've heard about that gets landfill, which is bad. It's not, a, it's, not it's, it's probably, I'd say probably e-waste, to answer your question, it's probably e-waste is probably the most, okay. because e-waste has a lot of chemicals that break down like in the ground. So, right. so you think about throwing a computer away into, into the trash. Well, you know, you just throw it away outside of mind. But what happens is that when it gets into the ground, all the chemicals from the, the components from that were to make the, to make the computer, it leaches into the ground and it leaches into the groundwater. And that's when we have a lot of issues. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, again, to answer your question, it would be probably the e-waste in the tech industry, but just the biggest polluters is probably the, the petro industry. Right, absolutely, got it. Uh, your company, Green Art Sustainable Solution Inc., yes. uh, which is based in San Jose, California. Yes. Uh, please talk about it. Was it like maybe one of the companies that's 
come to the market to actually mitigate this this conversation you're talking about? So, so when I so when I was at Tesla, 2016, uh -huh. we certified the facility a zero waste facility, which means that 90. So at one point, we we're 99.3% of everything that we generated was either re, uh, reused, repurposed, or recycled. Okay. Nothing went to land. Well, a small amount of material went to landfill. It was a major accomplishment. Okay, huge accomplishment. And I knew in 2006, I said, you know what, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life right. because I enjoyed doing it. I figured that if I can certify Tesla, this monster facility, they have one of the largest manufacturing facilities you know, in the, on the West Coast, automotive facilities, just ever, 10,000 employees. If I could certify this facility, I could certify any facility. Okay. And in 2006, I said, you know what, I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to do. So I left the company in 2017, took a year off. I, one thing about working at Tesla, I know I always talk, I'm talking about a lot, a lot about Tesla, but one thing yeah. about working at Tesla, it's like a dog's life. They say a dog's life is seven years. So if you work there four years, at 28 years, you worked, you worked for a company. It's that, they were, they were so driven, so it was just a very difficult place to work at. So yeah. I knew that I, when I left the company, I was going to start a company, do things a little bit differently. Because I think Elon taught me a couple things. He taught me two things. He taught me to take chances. You know, and, and, and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of any challenge whatsoever. And then he also taught me how to not, <laughs> not take care of your employees because he was very difficult. The guy was, he was very, very, very difficult to work for. So I think I'm a little easier boss to work for. But same passion, the same, the same drive that I had at Tesla, I have at my company. So okay. in 2018, I founded Green Earth Sustainable Solution. Um, we focus on zero waste. Um, so we'll, come, we'll go to a company, we'll teach them how to take the trash that they landfill and yeah. either physical trash, physical trash okay. so things that degenerate in their, their production, in, in their office, take the physical trash and recycle it. Take the paper out, instead of landfilling the paper, take the paper out. Uh, the food waste, compost the food waste. If you're throwing away metals or e-waste or whatever, take all that out of your trash, okay. don't put it in landfill and let's find a process to actually recycle it. So now yeah. I have, I have I have contracts with companies, big companies, okay. uh, that we manage everything for them. We manage all their their trash. We manage all their plastic recycling, metal recycling. And I did it slowly. I could have went in there and just said, hey, I'm gonna go get all this business. But right. I wanted to build it very slow because I believe in scaling up. I don't want to just get in there and get all this business and then not be able to, you know, be able to produce or maintain or I don't want to look bad, put it that way. I have a lot right. of friends in the industry that help me, that have given me opportunities, and I, do it, I did it slowly, very, very slowly. So Green Earth is my baby. I love, I love sustainability. I love talking about the environment. I love talking about doing the right thing. Yeah. Um, you know, this is, this is my dream. And I knew in 2016 that this is going to be what I was going to do the rest of my life. And I, and I know a lot of you guys out there watching uh -huh. me right now. The thing about a career or what you do, you have to have passion, you know, it's, you know, you can, you can be in a bad situation and say to yourself, you know, I'm in a bad situation, I don't want to do this, I can't find a job and everything else and have this negative thought, but and then yeah. take for granted those little jobs that you do, the little things that you do that can help you, you know, in a year from now, in a two, in two years from now, to help you get that better job that and understand. Good. And that's, again, that was, that's always been my mentality, you know, right. so at Green Earth, what I'm teaching, what I've taught a lot of my employees is like, look guys, um, we might not like what we do, but it's helping, and it's going to help us uh, move forward in our okay. careers. Mm -hmm. I do trainings. I give trainings all the time. I always tell people, listen, if you learn zero waste and you say that you have a sustainability background, you can walk into any company and, and get a job doing almost anything in the United States. It's, it's starting to turn here, you know, outside the United States. But inside the United States, if you say you have a, a, a sustainability background, you can get a job just about, I can meet with just about anybody. You name the corporation, and I could walk in that corporation and, can get and a meet job. with them. I could get it. No, I don't want a job. I'm, <laughs> I, I, I own a company. For the other person. Yeah, but Not I you. can go in there, and they'll <laughs> listen to what I have to say. Uh -huh. Okay. And there's a big company. I can't say their name right now. You're gonna, okay. I want you guys to follow me in okay. the next two months. There's a huge company that I uh -huh. just have. I, I, I'm not gonna say I landed, but yeah. I have this opportunity that you guys are gonna hear this uh, this amazing project that I'm working on. It's ama they're they're as big as Tesla. So just think right. about all the companies that are out there. Is they're as big as Tesla. And I can't mention their name. That's not an NDA, yeah. but it's gonna be this monster project. And it's because again, the passion that I had for the environment, right. being able to you know to articulate, you know, this is what I believe in. And this right. is what I'm going to do for you. And it's possible. It's possible. There's nothing, right. anything is possible.
All right, and, and that brings me to DPX. <laughs> According to me, it's like, <laughs> what I understood from that is, is like a philosophy, which is, I explained it as a bold approach to life. The uh. D stands for dream, P, plan, X is I got a chills fancy right way now, of me execute. Chills. Yes, just saying <laughs> what you're saying, I got chills. <laughs> Talk about it and, and, and how you're using it to advocate for all these causes that you have in terms of zero waste Thank management. Thank you for, I'm, I'm so glad that you brought up DPX. DPX, <laughs> guys, is my life. It's, it is what I believe. It's my, it's, it's when I wake up every day. Now I always tell people, you know, you know that say 24 seven? Yeah. Well me, it's 19 seven. So I, I, sleep, I sleep five hours, you know, I sleep about five hours a day. So but okay. for those 19 hours when I'm up, I'm thinking DPX. When I'm at work, I'm thinking DPX. When I walk down the street, I think DPX. It means DPX. DPX is this, guys. So as I mentioned before, I was dyslexic growing up. I didn't know I was dyslexic. I didn't find I was dyslexic until I was in my 50s. You know, like maybe six years ago is when I found I was, I was, I was dyslexic. Yeah. So uh, j just a little bit to, sto to, to get a little bit of, track, of traction on that. Maybe if you can explain what dyslexia yeah. is so that a person who is watching can uh, understand uh, you are dyslexic, dyslexic, dyslexic as a yeah. kid. So right. dyslexia is a, it's a, it's a, it's a learning disability. So, right. so people who are dyslexic, they're not mentally, you know, challenged or, or whatever. They're artistic. Even though when I was younger, I was put in a lot of these classes, put in special ed classes. Okay. It's just, it's just a learning disability. That something. It's like these little things in your brain just don't. They don't catch. Like when it's learning, it really affects your uh, reading, your uh, your writing. Um, you know, spelling, remembrance as well. Not so much remembrance. It's more. Okay. It's more just learning. And I I'll, when I get, well, I'll. I think I'll give you some examples of, of how, how having dyslexia, it, it affected DPX. Okay, right. so DPX, and there's a lot of children that are dyslexic. There's a lot of people in life that are dyslexic and they don't know it. Even and, in Africa. Oh, yeah. absolutely in Africa. Right. And the problem with that is being dyslexic and you don't know that, a lot of people judge you. They think, you know, because you're not smart in school. Like I'm a super yeah. smart, very smart, but I had a horrible in high school, terrible grade point average, but a very smart. Like when I would look at things, I could figure things out. And but you wanted I, to but walk I with write, Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, but, but writing uh, it down, uh -huh. you know, was difficult. Spelling was difficult. Just pronouncing words, even to this day, you know, I had a, a okay, you guys gonna hear it now. I have a list. So a lot of us, when I talk, I used to talk like this with my, you know, with mm. these S's. So yeah. that's why now you'll start hearing it now that I said it. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had a serious list. So I had a list, you know, dyslexic, and I didn't get diagnosed. So okay. growing up, like if I had, if I didn't have the mindset that I had as a child, I guarantee you I probably would have been a criminal. I probably mm -hmm. would have got into drugs. I would have gotten into something where, you know, low self-esteem, I would have low self-esteem because I've seen all these other children doing their thing, they're out there excelling, super smart. Because what happens, when you think about this, okay. the, the, the older generation, when they see a child, they see him real smart, what do they do? They pat him on the back, oh, he's so smart. And they, they pick them up, they fire him up, man, he's so smart. And then yeah. they go to the children that are struggling, maybe the ones that, that uh, you know, they, they, they had, you know, they're, they're struggling. Or autism yeah. as well. Or autism. Yeah. And they call them lazy. Oh, mm. they're lazy, they don't try. Where this kid, in his mind, he's thinking, man, I want to be, you know, I want to be great. I want to yeah. be smart. What kid wants to be called a dummy? You know what I mean? What kid, what kid wants to be called a dummy? There ain't no kid yeah. want to be called, I didn't want to be called a dummy or yeah. trifle or whatever, you know, when, when you're a kid. So, yeah. so it, and then, and then, then that, the be in that situation, not know why, and you're uh -huh. trying your hardest to mm. do good in school. But then what happens is that you don't, you can't figure it out. So now you become a clown. Yeah. So, now, so where was your family at this point and what were they saying? Where, where was dad? Where is mom? So, so, my, so my mother passed away when, when I was young. So I grew up with my, my stepfather. So my stepfather okay. raised me and he was gone all the time, all the time. So it was just me, the oldest, my brother and sister. So I had to kind of take the role as the, is somewhat of the parent. I used to go to parent teacher conferences, didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I used to go for my brothers and sisters. So there was no real parent, you okay. know, in my, in, my, in my life that was there following, doing, checking my homework or buy my school supplies. I mean, I have stories where, because my father, we were struggling. I used to work eight years old. I used to sell newspapers. I, so that's just a really good story. I'll have to tell you that another time. Okay. But, but, but I knew at eight years old that my father wasn't going to be able to buy the things that we, that we needed. So, okay. so that, to answer your question, is that there really wasn't a parent in my life. A lot okay. of my motivation came from self, self yeah, motivation. self motivation. Just okay. thinking about Shaka Zulu. Shaka Zulu, Zulu warrior, was my idol because he was okay. this big, strong, you know, African, African. man. Mm -hmm. Loved Shaka Zulu, you okay. know, and he was the guy that, you know. And I had other 
other people, uh, Alexander the Great, you know, these, these other people that I would read or hear these stories about that were just these great, like, men. And I wanted to be like that. So that was, okay. my, that was my drive, you know. All so right. while I was going through all the things I was going through, there really wasn't anybody. It was all self-motivated. Okay. And this is where DPX, so let me explain to you about DPX now. Yeah. In a minute, because we have to shift. <laughs> so in a minute. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I need more than a minute. No, I'm just joking. Okay. <laughs> so, so DPX is G uh, dream, plan, execute. Dream right. means you come up with a dream. Uh -huh. and, and it could be anything. And then you set a plan for it. It's a personal business plan for life. So it doesn't right. matter if you're poor. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter if you, you grew up in the slums. It doesn't matter. It's all about mindset. This DPX is about changing your mindset. I tell people you're never going to get rich in, in five minutes following DPX. You're going you're gonna to get over time. DPX is a, it's a life-changing th uh, thought process mm -hmm. okay. okay and i know you're saying you gotta wrap it up you know whatever but i'm saying the x in dpx means execute so d you have your dream p is the planning part of it so you write your plan out and there's a process a process to it you got and and the x is the executed. The thing right. about a DPX is you have to think about it every day. That's right. the whole thing about it. It's like DPX. your song. It's like a theme. <laughs> when it's you a, landed, uh, I, I was checking out your Insta story. When you landed in Dubai, it was DPX for life. When you landed at JK, it's DPX. D it's DPX like, for it's not life. DPX Africa. DPX <laughs> Africa. Yes. So, right. so I want I want your your viewers to to follow us to see what DPX is really about because it's, I should I want I want to talk more about DPX. Yeah. Tesla and all you that stuff a, has gotten me here. Hour yeah. More. <laughs> seriously, I need two hours for DPS. And more, uh, right. Seriously, because it's going to change the way that you think about the things that you do every day, no yeah. matter where you're at. And right. the thing is, it's free. There's no cost. There's no, there's no cost here. Right. The, the one thing in life, this is what I want to leave you guys with, the one thing in life that a person can't control is what you think. So exactly. if, you think, if you think you're strong, it doesn't matter if you're weak. You could be <laughs> the, the, the weakest person in the world. But if you think you're strong, and you have that mentality that you're not gonna let someone bully you, or maybe yeah. you're getting bullied, who cares? But you know two years from now, I'm gonna be this, 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 this manager somewhere because that's part of your DPX. Right. You're not gonna let that affect you. But it's about changing the mindset. If you're born poor and you think poor and you're poor, and yeah. I'm not saying poor in finances, I'm just saying the poor you poor the mindset. way you think, <laughs> mindset, then right. that's the way when you grow up, you're gonna be poor. But if you grew up thinking you're strong, doesn't matter where you came from, Right. And, and, and you're going to, and, and you, through life, you're going to be strong. You're going to be that warrior. You're going to be that Shaka Zulu. You're going to be able to do anything that you want. And right. you're going to have that from a small, a young age. All right. Uh, I'm told we have to wrap it up because you're, you're supposed to be in another session okay. as well. But also that led to your founding of, uh, is it uh, Dyslex Dyslexia Africa? Dyslexia Africa, yes. Right. I, actually, I'm, no, I didn't found it. They actually found me. Oh, they found you. And, and now <laughs> I'm, I'm their international ambassador. And I'm, I actually didn't get on their board. So right. this Dyslexia Africa is an amazing organization. Right. Um, I love what they do. We're going to probably start a, 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 a branch, a, a branch here in, in, in Kenya. In Kenya. Right. I'm looking for an office here in Kenya, actually. So I'm going to probably most likely get an office for Green Earth, and then we're going to share it with DPX yeah. and, and uh, African Dyslexia. But yeah, amazing yeah. group. Again, need to, need to follow up more on that. All right. And that would be actually an opportunity for people to you know, get a space where they can walk and learn and spread That's awareness. That's exactly what well. I want to do. I want to have a workshop. I want to do training. I want to teach people how to like get into the environmental industry, how to do zero waste, just everything. You know, there's so much that I have to share with right. this beautiful country and these beautiful people that I that I'm meeting and met. That just you guys don't understand the type of guy I am. You'll see. You'll see. I'm not right. one of those guys who just talk. Right. I love, love, love the motivation. Action. Love action. <laughs> Less than talk. Actually, a absolutely. All right. Uh, as we go, uh, for how long are you in here in Kenya? So I sh I'll be here about a month. All right. Yeah, I'll be here about a month. Or maybe it's, maybe it's longer than that. Maybe even six weeks. So we're all going right. all over. All right. Yeah. Uh, for anyone who has been watching and maybe they want to partner with you, they want to support, uh, they want to get more insights, or maybe yeah. they even want classes about DPX, yeah. how can they uh, so, get access to you on social media, so the, email? The best way is through Instagram right now. So my Instagram is hey, so H-E-Y underscore A Dante. Okay, get me there. That's one of the best ways. Now we have an email. It's DPX for life. Okay. DPX for life. Dot. Uh, no, it's it's no. I'm sorry. DPX. It's a, it's, it's a dot. It's a Dante. A Dante. A Dante. At DPX for life. Dot com. 
A Dante writing? at dpxforlife.com. Right. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. That's where yeah. You, anyone who wants to. Yeah, know on, more. on email. That's All that's right. our email. They can, they can and we're, we're we're developing our website. It'll it'll be done in probably a week or so. So you'll be able to get more information. But get me on Instagram. I'm telling you, that's the best way. And you'll see me. I talk every day. I talk into the camera. I'm yeah. talking to you guys about motivation, about DPX, about right. everything. It's a tech, really, really tech. Anything. A everything. All around. Just, you, you know, you've seen it, Brian. All right. <laughs> we have been speaking to Aaron Phillips. He's the founder at Green Arts Sustainable Solutions, Inc. from San Jose, California, the United States of the America. Yes. Right here live with us in studio on hashtag Thursday Vibes, Spot on Tech. We have to let you go. Thank you so much for appreciate your time. Appreciate it. No, appreciate that. Thank you, guys. All right. Uh, we have to take a very short break, but we are coming back with much more still on that hashtag, which is why in the morning at y two four four underscore channel on the ground, personally at Brian Subco 101. We take a break. We come back with much more. Stick around.